Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this evening's celebration of Swami Kriyananda's discipleship anniversary. And in many ways, we celebrate, of course, our own discipleship. Let's begin with a prayer together. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Great Masters, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, our blessed Swamiji, we invoke your presence with us this evening. Beloved Guru, open our hearts, help us to still our minds, that we may perceive thy living presence within us and around us. We offer our deep gratitude at the feet of Swami Kriyananda, who has shown us how we can live as a disciple and to find God through Guru's grace. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. So this evening is a very special evening as we celebrate our dear friend in guide Swami Kriyananda. And in 1948, Swamiji traveled across the country to arrive at Paramahansa Yogananda's feet with that desperateness in his heart to be accepted as a disciple of our great master. And in that moment, in many ways, all of our lives changed in that moment. And this evening we celebrate the life of Swamiji. We celebrate discipleship this evening as I'd like to welcome one part of this evening's flow is we have a few special guest speakers this evening. I think many of you know these guest speakers, uh, but thank you Nayaswami Jaya, Melody, and Latika for being with us and sharing. And we'll also have chanting from the Ananda monks and music by uh, various uh, musicians. And also just to share that at the end of the first portion, we are going to have a flower offering, which we invite everyone at that time, which I will announce when that time is, where we have two tables with beautiful marigold flowers that are grown here at Ananda. And we invite you to come up to the altar and to offer flowers, a symbol of your devotion and friendship to Swami Kriyananda. And then after you offer your flower, you're welcome to spend time at Swami Kriyananda's relics, which are, there are two altars and stations set up. Uh, thank you to Indra Devi for allowing us to, and setting this up for us. And just a few notes about this is that many of the items you can touch, and um, there are just a couple of items where you'll see the sign that will ask you not to touch them. And, um, but everything else, you know, feel free to um, commune with the vibration of these relics. And uh, there was one other point there on the relics. Um, the other point that Indra Devi would like for us to honor is just not to move the relics from the place in which they are. So I did a good job, right, Indra Devi? <laughs> okay. So I'd like to share. So then there's one last portion, which you're all invited to stay and participate in, is after the flower ceremony, we'll have about 20 minutes of the monks chanting, and we can be meditating and spending time with the relics. At 8.30, we're going to begin the Om Guru vigil, where we chant Om Guru for a half hour to start off this 24-hour vigil as we share blessings invoking our Guru's presence. So you're welcome to stay for that portion, which will be 8.30 to 9. And if you feel to leave, you can do so. So just to start off this evening, I'd like to end 
uh, before I invite, uh, we'll chant and we'll meditate for a little bit. But I wanted to share these words that always stuck close to my heart. And this, these words from Swamiji were spoken at the end of a talk that he gave in Calcutta in 2013. And these were his last words in that satsang, which I think let's all take this to heart and take this into the evening. And so Swamiji said, if there's anything which I can do with my life that I want to do is to help you to know what a great master he was and how that he can help you even now. I am blessed I lived with him and I hope you feel some of that blessing. So in the spirit of Swami Kriyananda's devotion and the power of his life, let us chant honoring his life in spirit, chanting, I want only thee, Lord, thee, only thee.
have a love who's far away, farther away than the stars. And yet she's stolen my heart away, heart away, heart away. She's stolen my heart away, farther away than the stars. Keep me not bound, no, teach me to fly. Far from Earth's madness, free air I die. Keep me not bound here, teach me to fly farther away than the stars. Nothing here nearly so dear, nearly so dear, nearly so dear. There's nothing here nearly so dear as her laughter. Stars. I have a love who's far away, far away, far away. I have a love who's far. Keep me not bound, no, teach me to fly, far from earth's madness, free air I die. Keep me not bound here, teach me to fly farther away than the stars. There's nothing here nearly so dear, nearly so dear, nearly so There's nothing here nearly so dear as your laughter away in the stars. There's nothing here nearly so dear, nearly so dear, nearly so dear there's nothing here nearly so dear as your laughter away in the stars sing with me on this refrain there's nothing here nearly so dear Nearly so dear, nearly so dear. There's 
nothing here nearly so dear as your laughter away in the stars as your laughter away in the stars as your laughter Thank you, Ron. That was very beautiful. It drives one inward in remembrance of Swamiji in that song. It was 74 years ago, at the age of 22, that James Donald Walters came to Los Angeles to meet his guru. And he repeated, or he made that question to his guru, his future guru, I want to be your disciple. And with those words, he defined his life for the rest of his life, for the rest of his years, until he passed on in 2013. And his life was defined by those words of discipleship, serving one's guru vigorously, full-heartedly with every ounce of his being. And that was who Swami was. And I, maybe I should say that is who Swami is. And it was the, you could say the one thing, somebody asked me the other day, to what were the things that inspired you about Swami's life, about his discipleship? And I had to think for a little while, but not for long, because I realized it was this, his one-pointed dedication to that principle of serving his guru in this life in every possible way he could, vigorously within all his energy. And I said, that is who I want to be as well. And I took that as my model, and Swamiji supplied that for me and guided me in my journey. I remember a story that Swamiji told originally, but I also had read it in the biography of uh, 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 Ramakrishna Paramahansa from Calcutta. And he tells the story of a village woman who lives within the village and she has children in her village and she has her family, but every day she goes to the local landowner and works in the home there, in the house, taking care of the children, cooking, doing whatever is needed as a servant in the house. And she applies herself one-pointedly to that service and does a marvelous job. But as Ramakrishna said in that story, he says, yet at all the time, where is her mind? Her mind is at her home. Her mind is at her village with her children. It's always in the back of her mind. That's where her heart is. And at the end of the day, she can't help but be eagerly, she goes home to her village. And in a sense, Ramakrishna and of course Swamiji in telling that story use this as an illustration of how we as disciples live in this world. We're in this world, but we're not of, the, of this world. And thinking back, this is exactly how Swami was. He was in the world serving vigorously as primary teacher for Self-Realization Fellowship, traveling the world, writing later on, writing books, writing songs. He was constantly doing something creative, but not creative for his own sake, you might say. It was creative in order to serve his guru's work. And that's how he was. He was outwardly demonstrating how we might be in our service, but yet inside, it's like that, that uh, poem of masters, waking, eating, serving, sleeping, chanting, meditating, yet constantly humming, God, Christ, Guru. God, Christ, Guru. And you could see this in him. Now, 
When I first met Swamiji, I, naturally you meet somebody and you tend to define them by their outward actions, what they're doing outwardly. Wonderful speaker, charming uh, storyteller, all of the outward things, and a, and a very wonderful man in that way. But I came to learn that there was another side to him, the side that perhaps many people, when they came to meet Swami at first, didn't see that deeper side. And I remember a story once, in my, an experience that I had with Swami. He was giving a satsang at his dome there over at Ayodhya. And he was, it was uh, maybe 20, 30 people were there. It was, some, it was very festive. I don't remember the exact occasion, but he was, it was, a, it was a lot of laughter. There was a lot, and it was very outward. And at that time in my life, I was a little, uh, less tolerant of some things. And I, I came to the satsang, and uh, I, I was sitting there, and I saw all these people around me, they're very outwardly, worldly in my mind. Now, that was a judgment. I was wrong about that. But nevertheless, I saw it that way. And I was just critical in my mind. I was going, why are people being like this so outwardly? And Swamiji, why are you letting these people be like this? You know, because it, it was not really, in my mind at least, a very spiritual atmosphere very party-like, you might say. And as I was, this was going through my mind, and as, as uh, you know, I was critical, criticizing. And in the midst of that, Swami looked at me, and he penetrated me, penetrated. I felt like a penetration beam coming at me. And he says, don't you understand what's going on here? Don't you understand? You know, because I was critical of the raucousness of the situation, but I was also a little critical of Swami. Swami, why are you doing that? What, what, what's going on? And he looked, and I could see, like he would speak about Master. Master would be very outward and engaged in what was going on, but if you looked into his eyes, you could see he wasn't there. There was somewhere else. Something else was going on. And that's that look that he gave me. And I said, oh, I understand he's doing the appropriate thing. In a sense, if I learned a lesson from Swami, be appropriate. The appropriate situation for what was trying to happen at that moment, but he wasn't there. He was God, Christ, Guru. And this is the mark of discipleship. He was a disciple in everything he's, he did, even the worldly things that had to be done outside. He did them to the best of his ability as an appropriate way, because yes, those two had to be done, those two, and that's what he was teaching me. He says, you have to be balanced in your life as a disciple, because we represent a great master in all aspects of life. Now, in India, there is a celebration. It's the, the month of June, July. It's called Ashara. And in that month of uh, June, July, there is a very major festival at that time. It's called Guru Purnima. And we hear sometimes, we celebrate it here as well, Guru Purnima, where you honor the Guru. But the thought came to me and when I was thinking about this talk today, and we're not honoring so much the Guru, and if we look back to the autobiography of the yogi, how does he start that autobiography master, that very first paragraph? Character, characteristic features of Indian culture, the concomitant qualities of, of a, a search for eternal verities and the guru, the, no, the disciple guru relationship have sustained India throughout the centuries. The importance, he started the autobiography with that, disciple-guru relationship. But yet in India, we celebrate the guru. I don't know of a festival that celebrates the disciple. And I think that is what we are putting in motion here, because both are of supreme importance. It's not easy to be a true disciple, a good disciple. Swami dedicated his life to that. And when asked, what would you like to be remembered for? He would said, I'd like to be remembered for he was a good disciple. Now that's not easy. A life of total dedication. So in a sense, here we have at Ananda, where I think 
we're initiating a new tradition here, a new festival of the disciple, Purnima. You might say it's not the full moon. Purnima means the full moon, but it's on the day of full moon. But yet this day of September 12th represents that. And Swamiji came with that message and Guru Purnima, just as it celebrates one's individual guru, it's often when you'll put flowers before the individual guru, or whatever one's, one's uh, tradition is. And sometimes it's forgotten in the celebration that we're really celebrating not the individual, we're celebrating the principle of the guru, which is not all that well understood often. In the same way, here we are this evening, we are celebrating discipleship, Swamis in this form of Swamiji's discipleship. But I think also we need to understand that we're celebrating or commemorating, maybe a good word, we're commemorating and honoring the role of the disciple. And this is something that's very important because you could say, and Swami has said this often, that discipleship is the essence of the spiritual path. Acting as the attitudes that go with that, the openness of heart that allows us to be able to receive God's grace, is to be able to relinquish and you might say transcend and offer up and self-offering, offering up that little self, that little ego self. That is the essence of what discipleship is. And how do we you could say, deepen that discipleship, it's through the process of attunement. And attunement, of course, is very easily identified, if we choose to, serving the guru. And who, if we look back in the particular, who served his guru? With body, mind, heart, soul, and all his strength. It was Swamiji setting that example and yes, he did, but remember something he always told us also. Remember, the great ones come into this world not to tell us how great they were. They come to tell us how great we can be ourselves. And so this is the message, you could say, I think, Swamiji, he is like that lady in the village, serving with heart and soul in every way possible. This is what we did, and he's calling us to do that. You know, he grew up in a very well-to-do family, but you could say, I think it's fair to say, that he was an unhappy young man. Why? He knew intuitively, lifetimes perhaps from the past, he knew something was missing. And what was it, of course, what was missing was God. God was missing, and when he read that autobiography and he says he traveled across the country immediately, he went to fulfill and fill that hole that was in his heart. And by meeting his guru and pledging his service, pledging his life to the guru with all his heart, mind, and soul, he was able to fill that hole that he felt as a young man. And this is what all of us, and I think we take Swamiji because I, as our example, because each of us too, I think all of us in some point in our lifetime, in the origin, well, I'd say our lifetime as a devotee coming onto the spiritual path, we felt that hole, something was missing. And I think using Swamiji as that example of how we might fill it is we have we become disciples. But discipleship doesn't, doesn't end by just taking a vow. That vow needs to be acted upon. And so each of us, in however we act in our day-to-day -day life, whatever we do, think of it as acting as a disciple, because that's what we are. We're representatives. That is our spiritual identity. Yes, we're a Kriyabhan. Yes, we do that in an act of discipleship. As a disciple, we act in whatever it is we do in this life. We buy groceries. We relate to that grocer as a disciple. We, be, we act 
And this is, again, coming back to that story I said of myself, we act appropriately in every situation as a disciple. And in the back of our mind, as we're acting, as we're doing, whatever it is, God, Christ, Guru. God, Christ, Guru. Om Guru. Thank you, Jaya. And thank you for having me tonight. Thank you, Jitendra, for asking me to speak. It's nice to be able to give back to the community in some way, if I can. And it also gives me the opportunity to live more fearlessly, <laughs> as Swamiji did. So as I was thinking about the significance of this event of Swami meeting Master for the first time so many years ago, and us here now celebrating and honoring that event, uh, it just reminded me that our path is rooted in that guru-disciple relationship. And 
It's almost as if the guru is holding our hand in one hand at this image, and on the other side, the guru is holding hands with God because the guru is here to introduce us to God. And he won't ever ask of us anything that God himself wouldn't ask of us. We all know those were some of the words that Master actually said to Swami on the, the day of their meeting because I think Swami hadn't yet found someone who he felt was worth following. <laughs> and so he had some doubts, but Master reassured him that there was no personal motive in the relationship. He was only there to act as an instrument of God, to be like a window to the infinite. And as I was thinking back on my own disciple um, ceremony, which I think is a, a really sweet thing to do on an occasion like this, just as couples are encouraged to think about their early days together or <laughs> the day that they took their uh, wedding vows. I think each of us can receive inspiration by sort of transporting ourselves back to the day that we took our discipleship vows and how meaningful that was for us. And I think what I remember most from that ceremony is not only just the sweetness of it all and the deep gratitude, but just really this feeling of comfort like coming home. I was only 14 at the time when I took my uh, discipleship vows, and you know, that's a time in life where you definitely need guidance. <laughs> I, I still need it every day of my life, but definitely then it's like you're trying to figure out which direction should I move, where should I focus my energy, and thank God for Yogananda and for Swami introducing uh, me to him, and just that feeling of comfort, like, okay, my life is in good hands from now on. Not that I didn't have to put out any energy, or <laughs> it's not like the work had been done yet, but there was just this feeling of, okay, as long as I stick with him, I'm going to be okay. And um, the idea of Master being a guide has always been something that's touching to me because a guide implies wisdom, right? He, he has to know the way <laughs> if he's going to lead others. So a master's already walked this path. He's already been through the struggle. He's won the battle. He knows the struggles that lie ahead, the obstacles, and Unlike us, he knows what's going to happen tomorrow and next year <laughs> because he lives in timelessness. So who, who, sh who else can we trust but someone like that? Um, I remember as a teenager actually praying for someone uh, to have a friend that I could always depend on, someone who I could always share my thoughts and feelings with, and I just wish there was someone who was always available, but no human can possibly be <laughs> available that often. And I soon realized, oh yes, the, the friend that I've been seeking, I already have. He's, he's right here. I just haven't been relying on him enough. And you know, the other great news is that the master because he's walked the trail, he's walked the path, he also knows the shortcuts. <laughs> Hence the reason he called Kriya Yoga the airplane route to God. Thank goodness for that. And so I was just thinking about what are the ways in which I've found success over the years in tuning into the guru and his guidance. The first way I've found is through asking for guidance. <laughs> kind of seems simple, right? But how many times do we forget? You know, we've probably all been to a meeting where we forgot to pray at the beginning and oh boy, things didn't <laughs> go so well. Um, so just asking, remembering to ask for the Guru's grace, ask what do you think about this situation? What, what choice should I make here? 
and then listening for the response, right? That's, that's kind of tricky to remember too, is we ask and then we just go about our business. And I think we all have beautiful stories that we could share uh, where we you know, could compare the times where we brought the guru along with us and the times when we didn't. <laughs> and you can compare the results and sometimes they're, they're really drastic. Um, I have a real simple example. Yesterday I was um, feeling a little anxious and concerned because our two cats hadn't come home in the evening at the time that they usually arrive. And uh, the next morning they still weren't there. And th anyone who has pets, you know, they're like family members. So it, it was concerning and we do see a lot of um, predators lurking in the area. <laughs> and um, so as I was sitting to meditate that morning, I was just talking inwardly to God, just keeping that conversation going that I so much enjoy. <laughs> and uh, I said something like, or just thought something like, oh, it would be so nice to continue to enjoy those sweet cats that you've gifted us with <laughs> for a little bit longer, <laughs> if it's your will. And in a few moments, I heard the cat door open and <laughs> one of the cats came into the meditation room and sat with me and a few moments later, the second one came in and it was just beautiful, you know? It's like when you see uh, those things happen in your life time and time again, you realize it's not a coincidence. You know that there's this beautiful relationship that's building and there's love there, there's comfort, there's support, there's, you know, a response, it's real, it's, it's a living presence. And the other way that I've found, you know, success in staying present with the guru is through practicing the techniques that he's given us. So for me especially, Kriya has been such a, a root, a solid, foundation to um, base my life on. And I think, you know, as we <clears throat> bring that energy up and down the spine, it really does create this strong magnetism. And over the years, you know, you start to feel like that energy really is withdrawing from the body, from the personality, from the likes and dislikes, and you can just enjoy that feeling of, instead of feeling so separate from the goal or from um, the masters, you start to feel it as a reality that, you know, God is ever with me and I know it from experience and um, there's just nothing quite like that. So I'm deeply grateful for that and I found that if there are, are times when we aren't, you know, constantly, daily, offering our energy up to be united with our source, with higher consciousness, then it's just so easy for those vrittis, those whirlpools in our spine to pull us down because they have momentum. They have been swirling for <laughs> years, for countless incarnations, and so we have to be making a conscious effort to bring that current, that river of energy up and tossing those seeds of karma into the spiritual eye. And, you know, we have no idea how much karma is really being burnt up when we focus here at the point between the eyebrows. Regardless of whether we see the light or not, I think a lot more is happening than we uh, can, can realize. Um, and I was just thinking the, the scriptures promise us even a little practice of this inward religion, Kriya meditation, <laughs> will free us from dire fears and colossal sufferings. I don't know about you, but I'd like to avoid some of those uh, <laughs> dire fears and colossal sufferings if possible. And um, so just living in the presence of God and, and practicing regularly. Uh, when I first received Kriya, I remember uh, hearing a 
Dave Rishi play a chant for the first time that I had never heard before. And I think we all know how sweet it is when we hear a new chant. It's like, wow, <laughs> what's this one? And it was desire my great enemy. <clears throat> and there's a lot of words in there and uh, I was just soaking it all up. I mean, imagine hearing that chant for the first time at your first Korea, it was pretty epic. <laughs> and um, when the phrase came, you won't have to fear anything anymore. I was like, whoa. Something pierced my heart open and the, the tears came. It was just like, wow, who can promise, who can make such a promise? Who can give us such security in the world that we live in today? And it was just like, wow, this is the best gift ever, I've got to stick with this. And it's not like I ever thought of myself as a fearful person or anything like that. It was just like, wow, this is, this is something to be really grateful for. So just to um, honor Swami tonight and his example of living fearlessly in every way, I was just thinking about you know, when he was building this community, he came upon challenge after challenge, so many problems and difficulties which he felt that sometimes were seemingly impossible to solve. And yet, time and time again, there were solutions given to him. And he said, you know, if this is only solutions that only come now and then, you could say it is a coincidence or good luck, but because they kept coming over and over again, he knew God was with him. He knew Master was giving him those uh, solutions. And in that sense, he felt like Master really did build this community. And, you know, even when his own guru bhais tried to take everything from him, he realize there's one thing that they can never touch, which is his connection to master, that guru-disciple relationship. And so may we continue to live inspired by his beautiful example, and each of us receive inspiration from each other because we're all living this beautiful life of devotion and dedication to the guru. share a little bit tonight about one aspect of Swami's service that has been extremely meaningful to me, and that's the writing of all the music that he's given us. 
I feel like it's one of the deepest ways that he shared with us because he has, even more than in his talks, except perhaps later in his life, he, sh he bared his heart and his soul to us in that music. The lyrics, even the music itself, has such sweetness, such longing for God contact, such dedication to his guru and to the path. It comes out, I think, more in music even than when he speaks, except, as I said, perhaps in the last few years of his life when his talks got to be less about the teachings per se and more just about him expressing God's love and joy to all of us. I first met Swami in 1978 when he was taking a tour around the U.S. and uh, he had with him a group of singers. I think Durga and Vidura were in that group and probably some other, a few others here. And I don't remember anything Swami said that night. I couldn't tell you anything about what he talked about, any particular phrase, nothing. I remember the music. I remember how deeply touched I felt, not just by the words, but also by the music itself. It was so deep, so sweet, and so peaceful, so full of calm faith is what came across to me. And I, they had a little book table there, and a few items were being sold. This was the very early days, so there were not the zillions of products that we have now. Just a few things. And one of the things they had was a cassette tape of this group of singers singing some of Swami's music. And I purchased that cassette tape, and I played it every day until it broke. <laughs> if you all know about cassette tapes, you know they don't have the, the durability of our current forms of music. And then when I moved to, to Ananda in about uh, 41 years ago, I had the opportunity to be closer to the music. And the music, of course, had evolved. Swami had written more songs, had created uh, instrumental pieces that I didn't know existed. There was so much that he had to offer through the music. And part of my sadhana all these years has been to listen to and or sing Swami's music every day. It's a really wonderful thing. I, for me, it's been life-changing. It's especially useful if you have times when you really can't meditate, or you don't have enough time to go deeply into your meditation, or your meditation is dry, or your mind won't stop. Music can bring you back into the center of your being, especially this divine music that Swami has channeled to us. It's meant so much to me over the years in so many different circumstances. I remember uh, working on the lawsuit uh, for a number of years, and we basically worked seven days a week, 12 hours a day during that time. Well, by the time you got to sit in the meditation room, there wasn't much left. <laughs> but there was always Swami's music. And now I'm a caregiver for my husband, and I don't have much time. My day is full from morning to end. But if I carry that music with me throughout the day, I can stay uplifted, I can stay connected, I can feel Swami's energy, I can feel his dedication to his guru and to these teachings, and then I can pull that into myself. I can feel it, I can feel it growing in myself. These songs that were sung tonight, I think are very special songs of Swami's. They are in that category of him sharing deeply his own inner yearning for God and his faith that God is there for him, God's call within, that's God calling to the soul. I live without fear. As Melody said, Swami did live fearlessly. There was nothing that ever shook him. Again in the lawsuit, I saw him attacked verbally, almost physically at times, and he never lost his calm inner peace. He stayed strong, he stayed clear, he stayed true to himself, no matter what was thrown at him. And when I had to get up on the witness stand and testify, that gave me courage. I really could feel that he had surrounded all of us, had, had shown all of us how to live in that time. And I really think that song, I Live Without Fear, it might be construed to be about death, but Swami wrote that song when he was only 59 years old. 
And I don't think it was about death. I think it was about living without fear, no matter what darkness comes into our life. So there's a lot that you can get out of Swami's music. Even if you just listen to the music itself, it's so uplifting, it's so heart-touching, it's so meaningful to us as spiritual beings because it's divine music. He's, it came to him, he never talks about, he says my music, but he also says, this isn't my music. This music was given to me. Well, who gave it to him? Master, God gave it to him. So when we tune into that music, we also can feel that connection that Swami had with Master. We can take that into our discipleship. I'd highly recommend, I'm sure all of you do listen to Swami's music, do it more. <laughs> sing it, even if you're not a singer, sing it at home. Sing it when there's community sing-alongs. It'll help change your life. It just is such a remarkable gift that he's given us. So that's what I wanted to say about, about Swami and his discipleship. Just what, how many ways he's given us to learn to be a disciple. He's given us meditation. He's given us the community. He's given us all the writings and the philosophy. And he's given us this divine music. Thank you, Swamiji. Thank you, all of you. And now we're going to transition to our flower offering ceremony. So when we come up to offer our flowers, which are located here at the front of the dais, I invite you to come up uh, more in an Indian bob. So just kind <laughs> of come on, come on up in groups of six or whatever it may be, um, just so we have time to spend time meditating with the relics and you're welcome to meditate here in the sanctuary for as long as you'd like and let's feel that we're offering our devotion to the living presence of of swamiji here on this very beautiful altar that shraddha created for us <laughs> 